Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr. Tom, how's it going? Well, Tony, I was delighted to log on to the Huddle Board presented by Jeff Ruby Steakhouse at BuckeyeHuddle.com just a day or so back and click on a thread about what I thought was going to be like, you know, hey, like an off-topic conversation about like, hey, what do you guys like to... You know, what's your setup when you sleep? You, you, you got like a fan going you get because the title was the title of the thread was white noise. And I thought, oh, well, this is, you know, I, I have I have thoughts on this. And so I clicked on it and Tony found out you've been talking mess. Uh, someone's like, hey, um, you know, that's that's the nickname that Tony gave Tom. Apparently, while I was out of town and not paying attention to the board. So, Tony, would you like to explain yourself, sir? No, I'm good with it. No, this was just something that was mentioned in the, on a live show recently, and I was talking about white noise, and then I had an aside and I said, which is also my, my, my nickname for Tom. Then Kevin and I had a great laugh, and the crowd loved it. And uh, so a nickname was born. So now we've, we've got K-pop for Kevin, and all white noise for Tommy Orr. And, I have one for you, Tony. No, 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 it's okay. We don't need it. Go ahead. Chief Yahoo, your thoughts. No, Chief. I don't like the Chief. Um, I've never yeah, liked Yes, chief. I know. Yes, that's, that's the whole point. Yes. But the, the white noise thing, and this is interesting, and I know people don't always like our asides. They leave those reviews to let us know. I was listening to some green noise, which is like nature noise, recently, um, you know, months ago. And now Spotify has this virtual DJ. It's like, hey, we're going to play the music that you like, all your tracks that you like. Why is it sometimes they, here's one you listened to three months ago, and it's like, Psh. it's like, just give me some green noise when I'm like listening to Green Day or like Pearl Jam. And now here's some sounds from the forest. And I get, I, AI is not quite there yet, Tom. This is my latest bit of proof. Yeah, it feels like you should be able to differentiate, you know, here's the stuff that you're listening to at, uh, you know, from approximately 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I wonder what those hours have in common and uh, why you only listen to the rainforest noises during that hour, those times. But, you know, hey, listen, we don't want to make any assumptions, Tony. We don't want to yuck anyone's yum. This is just, you know, hey, whatever you, whatever you, into, where you're into, we're not here to shame you for it. No, well, because Kevin's not here or else we would shame him for something that he's into. Anyway. Let's move on to the topic of the show, and we're going to be doing a series here, which is um, going back in time, and today's episode is going to be uh, picking three players, each of us, Tom and I, maybe we pick the same players, but three players from the John Cooper era to put on this Ohio State football team to get them over the top, to ensure a, a national championship, if you will, to ensure, well, can't ensure a win over Michigan with Cooper players, but... Ensure too some soon. too soon. Some some holes that can be filled, if you will. Tom, I've got I've got two names bolded, and then I will I think I know what I'm gonna do with my third, but I will let you go first. Well, and before we start, mm, yes, we had agreed to a stipulation before the show, and this is something that Tony threw out, which I thought was fair which is, no, you can't pick Orlando Pace because Orlando Pace would be your first pick for virtually any of these. And I said, that's fine, but then you can't pick Antoine Winfield, who would be Tony's first pick for virtually everything. Just And this is purely out of spite. I don't know. You know, Antoine Winfield was fantastic. Ohio State's pretty well set in the secondary. So I don't know if you even would have picked Orlando or Antoine Winfield. We're saying no. So when we're not picking Orlando Pace here, mm -hmm. that's why. Tony, yeah. do you know who played under John Cooper who was not Orlando Pace? Well, the answer is a lot of people. But one of those people, Tony, was Corey Stringer. And guess what Corey Stringer did? Corey Stringer did a lot of the same things that Orlando Pace did at about 95% of the uh, ability of Orlando Pace. And I think I'm, you know, I, I feel pretty decent about the offensive line right now for Ohio State. But, you know, if you put Orlando, if you put Corey Stringer at left tackle, and you move Josh Simmons over to right tackle, or you throw Corey Stringer at right tackle, and you move Josh Fryer into that right guard spot, you know, whatever, however you want to shuffle those guys, putting Corey Stringer on that line makes that offensive line better, and I think moves Ohio State at least another step, step and a half closer to being a national champion this year. 
I'm with you 100%. That was the first name on my list. They had they have a question mark on the right side. Corey Stringer played right tackle at Ohio State once Orlando Pace came over. You want to put him there? Go ahead. You want to put him there at left tackle and move Josh Simmons back to right tackle where he played at San Diego State? I'm all for that as well. This to me is the the no-brainer of the entire bunch. You'll figure it out later. And like everywhere else, all of these other names that I have listed, and I think I have like seven or eight or nine, you can make arguments that you don't need those guys. This guy, Corey Stringer, um, RIP, could definitely be used like left, left side, right side, and it would just completely, I think, solidify things or make everybody feel much better about this offensive line. You've got a guy that can be an anchor whichever side you want to put him on. And so, yes, well, and I, I remember, would agree with that. Yeah, do you remember what they did the year that they had both Stringer and Pace, mm-hmm. which would have been 94, I believe? Uh, they would put tackles over, and you'd have Stringer and Pace on the same side of the line, which you want to keep Fryer in at right tackle and Simmons in at left tackle and just put Corey Stringer in as the uh, you know the bison package extra blocker. That's fine. I'll take him there, too. I think this is one of those... You can slot him in just about anywhere on that offensive line and shuffle guys up just about anywhere you want to on that offensive line, and I think you end up with a better a better line and a better offense. And boy, you know, I think we have reasonably high expectations for what that running game could be this year with the addition of a running quarterback and the addition of Quinchon Judkins to Travion Henderson and an improved offensive line and the Chip Kelly scheme stuff. All that kind of stuff seems like it's going to add up to a better running attack. Boy, you throw... Corey Stringer into that mix, and I think that only makes things better. And I can't remember if they both also did this, but would be in short short yardage defense, the defensive line as well, and like the goal line. I know Orlando Pace did it. I would assume uh, you know it's it's thirty years ago by this point, but I think Corey Stringer did it, and they both would also be in there for field goal kicks as well. Uh, But yes, those two were awesome together. So that was uh, one of mine as well. I will move on, Tom, to somebody that. They don't need, but you can always use, and that's Big Daddy Dan Wilkinson. And you you want to put him right next to Tyleek Williams and let those two go? I mean, they, they're they not quite as deep as they need to be on the defensive line. I'm not saying Big Daddy's coming off the bench. I'm saying Ty Hamilton can continue to come off the bench, share, share some of those reps like we did with Mike Hall last year. Get Big Daddy in there, penetrating defensive linemen. A guy that is going to help the run defense is going to be the focus of an offensive line. And we saw with Chase Young back in 2019 when one guy is the focus of an offensive line, everybody gets just, it creates so much havoc with everybody else, especially when that focus still can't stop that guy. And that's kind of what happened with uh, Big Daddy back in what, 93, 94, where he was um, just an incredibly disruptive guy. I still remember. Maybe it was a 93 game against Washington. Him and DeMarco Farr just going back and forth, both defensive tackles wreaking havoc in those games, in that game. But Big Daddy, uh, not a need, but you're going to take him. Well, okay, here's a good rule of thumb. If you have a guy who turns out to be the number one overall Mm -hmm. draft pick and you have a chance to add him to your team, I would suggest that you do that. And we did not have the uh, option to do that with Orlando Pace. Uh, and, you know, we'll see if uh, Joe Burrows makes anyone's list when we do the uh, Meyer era teams. But, yeah, I think this is uh, I think this is about as big of a no brainer as you can as you can come up with. This is an Ohio State team that just does not have that many holes right now. We've you know, Ryan Day talked about, you know, his areas where it's like, well, were you not totally settled? And he got to like backup defensive tackle and uh, depth at linebacker and that kind of stuff real, real early in the conversation. They're just. The, the front line defense is pretty darn good. So, you, you know, you have marginal upgrades you can make here and there. But, you know, I you want to you put the, few, the number one overall draft pick who was as disruptive as anyone and just, I mean, just a massive human being in the middle of that line. I don't think anyone, I, I think if you brought, uh, brought Big Daddy Wilkinson in, Ty Hamilton would say, welcome. Uh, I will, you know, you let me know. You tap your head and I will run right in there. I, I, I don't think anyone's going to... Uh, Anyone's going to have a big issue with that one. And uh, one of the other names, and we'll, we'll eventually get into a bunch of the other names, but like um, like Alonzo Spellman towards the, the start of the, the Cooper year, like just I want somebody I can also bring in first off the of the bus and then just terrify everybody and go from there. But uh, who's your next guy? 
All right. So I'm going to go, I, I kind of was looking at positions where, you know, where do they maybe need another, another body that there's a solid option. Give me Ricky Dudley as a tight end. I think that's someone who, you know, you're not, you're definitely not desperate for uh, pass receptions this year. And, you know, I don't know that he puts up the numbers this year with the offense that he did back in 1995. But he get, you know, he was just a very good all around player. Turned into a decent blocker. He was, you know, he was not the single greatest molar on the offensive line. He was more of a receiving tight end. But, you know, he he was a good all around player. Ended up a first round pick from the Raiders. So you know, was was very very highly thought of coming out of school. Put up stats at Ohio State. I think that's a spot where, you know, G Scott. I think they're feel they feel pretty good about. Who's the number two tight end? I don't know that they know who the number two tight end is, but if you have Ricky Dudley there, you know who your top two tight ends are. Yeah, the ninth overall pick by the Raiders, um, what, 30 or 40 some receptions, 35 receptions, maybe they're 95. Just a complete freak athlete, played on the basketball team, was a power forward, like 6'7, 250. Looked like you would, he was a created player and could you know, run. And I think they said at the time, like high four fours, but which is probably, you know, four fives or whatever, but a ridiculous athlete had a pretty decent jump shot as well. I'm not going to lie. You know, he, he had mid mid range game, but, uh, was, was a really, really effective guy. He was the number four player that I listed. And I, I don't, I think that is one of the areas when you look at, cause there, there's a couple of ways to do this. What do you need? Who would be the best players? And, I think in, in each of these eras that we'll do, we'll start with um, Cooper today, and then uh, then we'll move on to Trestle, and then move on to the Urban Meyer. You're always looking at, could somebody in the tight end room help them? And this is, you're talking about the the single highest drafted tight end in Ohio State football history, and, you know, of modern football. I don't know, maybe like a Billy Andrews got drafted in fourth overall when he was in the end, 1956 or something, you know, but... This is a, a guy who was very effective, very productive, and a complete mismatch with um, with a passing game. And so, I, yeah, I think it'd be interesting to watch him. People are going to say he can't block. I don't know who who was paying attention to that. Thir I hate saying thirty years ago now, but that's that's where we are. I mean, well, 29, 29 that, years ago. That's not right. The nineteen sixties were thirty years ago. You're way off. Aren't you going to be embarrassed when you do the math? So my third one, it, and I'm, I, I'm going back and forth on this one because I, I think it's crazy when you consider some of the defensive backs that Ohio State had back in the 90s in the Cooper era. Like, I'm not considering any of them. Do you go quarterback? Do you go, um, you know, linebacker might be a concern just because you don't necessarily know for sure. I do think, Tom... Uh, you, you've got an opportunity for some father-son combos. You could go Andy Gerd. You could go Lorenzo Styles. I mean, the whole Brawny LeBron thing is in vogue now. Do you do you bring somebody back from the from the past to uh, play with their son? Part of me, I, I don't want to mention all of these names because we'll talk about them. I, I think it just comes down to confidence, and I'm I'm leaning. This is very difficult. I'm thinking, I was thinking Joe Germain, but now that I'm here I, and having to say it, Tom, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I know a lot of people are screaming for Andy Katzenmore. If this is like Family Feud, you know, you'd be hearing the, or like prices, right? They're just shouting down prices. Let's go. I, I feel, oh man, this is tough. This is tough. This is a lot tougher than some of the others. So I will go, and I, I won't even agree with this, because I believe all of these guys could be listed and uh, would be, and, and I'm, am, I, am, I, am I delaying? Is this a delay tactic, Tom, as I try to really convince myself? I should just go with the third guy that I have listed. So that's what I'm going to do. And it's a completely, um, it's emotion-based. It's wanting to right a wrong. This is basically... If I was Quantum Leap, I would go back into the past 
to right a wrong, and that wrong would be bringing this player to the future. Can, to can the I present stop day. and guess? Can I stop yeah. and guess? <laughs> okay, first of all, first step: uh, if you if you do become quantum bleed, number one, kill Hitler. Number two, bring Joey Galloway to the present day. Do I win? Tom, you did. Uh, I want I want Joseph Scott Galloway, as uh, Kirk Herbstreit calls him, to play in the modern college football and then eventually the modern pro football. I would like to see somebody that runs a 4-2, benches 400 pounds, can play anywhere, do whatever you need in this in today's game where things are spread out and you have to tackle players and you have to tackle a receiver 10 times a game instead of, uh, you know, tackling and covering. Like, there, there are so many different things that you would have to do against Joey Galloway. That I, do they need him? No. But this is, again, not the deepest receiver room that Ohio State has had. Does it mean that maybe uh, Jeremiah Smith comes off the bench? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, again, this is a top 10 NFL draft pick we're talking about with Joey Galloway. Put him in there. I feel like, Tom, this, you know, you remember, you remember Timeline, the movie, well, the Michael Crichton book turned into a movie. Gerard Butler, they're, they're present day archaeologists and somebody that goes back in time. One of the archaeologists just decides to uh, stay back in time, back in like France in like the 1400s, because that's what he's studied his whole life. I feel like if you 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 go to the past, you bring Joey Galloway back to the future, I think he would end up staying here. I think he'd find it to his liking. I think he would have a lot of fun in today's game. And I this is just me doing him a solid. Ohio State wouldn't necessarily need it. I might cost them a national championship. I don't care. I think it's worth it. Boy, you had that whole aside about the uh, Michael Crichton book, and I thought I was 100% sure the answer was, and Tony stays in 1994. Like, I was sure that was going to be where that one was going. Some of me has. I don't, I feel, I don't, uh, I don't think they Did have, you hear my uh, music used, takes earlier? I was going to say, I don't think used kids records is on high street anymore. So you could go back, go back in time and go back to the good high street. Yeah, I think, uh. Yeah, I, that that uh, that I think I was sure that was where that was going. But yeah, I think I think Joey Galloway in the you know g- give Joey Galloway C.J. Stroud as his quarterback. Oh man, him, just let him cook. Let's see what that looks like. Give you know Justin Field. Any I mean, really any of the modern Ohio State offenses, but with, you know with specifically, we put him in that 2018 offense with Dwayne Haskins. We could have the same conversation with about Ted Ginn, and maybe we will uh, on uh, one of the upcoming shows. Uh, yeah, I think I think Joey Gallo is a great answer. I I considered all of the names that you mentioned there. You know, Andy Katz and Moyer, Joe Germain. I think those are all great answers. You know, I and and I think they are perfectly defensible answers. I am going way off the board here, and this is one that you didn't mention. And I think I think this is going to be a name that I'll say, and then people are going to go, "Oh yeah, Tony, how about Rob Murphy, offensive guard?" First team All American. Mm-hmm. I think he might have been a first round pick by the Colts, just you know, and had that kind of nasty streak that I think would translate well to the middle of the Ohio State offensive line this year. You know, absolutely not the most, you know, the, the biggest name player, absolutely not the most acclaimed player, but just someone who I think might fit in well uh, and slot into that right guard spot and just sort of. Just sort of be the answer there and give them a little bit of uh, a little bit of attitude that you know I think I think this team's offensive line has a little bit of a mean streak but we'll see how much of a mean streak it would be more of a mean streak if Rob Murphy was there so I I think that's uh, you know certainly not the biggest name answer and I'm sure not one that a lot of people would have thrown out there but I, as I was thinking it through I thought mm, that might that might not be a bad fit there that's pretty good he was a uh, two time All American I believe. At guard, and uh, you mentioned uh, a mean streak. Then he went on to play uh, in the CFL, so he had to get rid of some of that mean streak. You can't be Canadian. You can't play Canadian football and be mean about it. But as Tom, I tell the the Rob Murphy story every time it comes up. Back in college when he was still there, I I showed up at um, Panini's at like 3 in the morning after the outer end had closed or whatever, and he's, he's behind the counter helping make sandwiches. And this was like, this was an All-American. Clearly, he should not be back there. Like, he was in no state, no condition to be serving food and, and taking money because when I tried to pay him, he was like, nah, don't worry about it. And so, you know, for, for a college student to get a free, uh, like, $8, $6 steak sandwich with fries after a night out of the bar, like, that was, I will never, I will never forget him. That's why I've mentioned that on this show 
at least seven times over the years, like once a year at this point. That was an indelible mark left on me. That is a good man. I apologize for not putting him on this list. And when you're talking about the Ohio State offense, the, the team, the right guard being an issue, he played left guard, but I'm pretty sure he can handle playing right guard or you, you move Donovan Jackson to right guard, whatever. Like, yeah, that's a guy that is going to do a whole heck of a lot for your offensive line, for your mentality, for the desire to get back to the running game the way it was. You bring Rob Murphy in, and now you're, you're talking about some physicality. So I, I really like that one. In that same vein, Tom, one of the the other names I had on my list, the Charles Bentley. Mm -hmm. If you really want to get greedy, go ahead and put Corey Stringer and you know Rob Murphy, and then you know what? Go ahead and bring in the Charles Bentley. All three of those guys, um, <clears throat> all together, and the Charles kind of bridged the gap. Like he was with Cooper and Trestle, so like there's a little bit of um, question there, but. Um, yeah, I, Rob Murphy is a good one. I, I would I'd be okay with that. That's just a, that's one where you draft it and everybody's like, what? And it's like, no, 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 no. Just wait. This is not this is not your fantasy team that we're worried about. This is, this is one that you know four years down the road, you're like, man, I'm so glad we still have that guy. Like, you know, whatever. Like this, or you know, two months down the road, like, oh man, you just rush for however many yards against Oregon. I'm so glad we had it. Yeah, they kept going right behind Rob Murphy. Congrats on that one. So good one. Tom, one of the reasons I I, I was considering Andy Katzmoyer and Lorenzo Styles, I think you know both of those guys were very good middle linebackers. Um, the, 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 the shoulder pads and the uniforms were much bigger back then. So it makes them look like they're too big to play in, in today's game. Too big and too cumbersome to play in today's game. But Andy Katzmer were like 6'4", 250, 260 by his junior year. But he was like 6'6", 280 based on the, the, the uniforms and the shoulder pads. It's, it's, like like Fletch like, where um, Fletch is, it's like Fletch where Fletch is, uh, you know, 6'4", exactly. but 6'8", with the afro. It's, yeah, Andy Katzmer, 250, 280 with the pads, yeah. But like you know, Jack Campbell, Iowa linebacker, was that big, and he played just fine. So I'm I'm gonna assume Andy Katzmoyer could do it. I think Lorenzo Styles could definitely do it because he was a normal size linebacker. It's just when you wear number ninety as well, you look you look too big. You see him right behind me, right there, actually. Um, but should we not consider Joe Germain, Bobby Hoying in this? And I did consider both of them. The reason I didn't go with them, I guess, is because. Will Howard has a ton of experience. He has started some, a bunch of games. If he had, if there, if there was no Will Howard in this, and there was no transfer quarterback, I think um, I would definitely have one of the two quarterbacks here. I don't know which one, which is one of the issues, one of the reasons I didn't go with either, because I couldn't pick which one that I thought it should be. Yeah, and that's I. I would have probably leaned Jermaine. Just, I mean, the stats were a little better, but it was just, it was also a little bit of a different offense. I, I frankly am shocked we've had this long of a conversation and no one said Terry Glenn's name. That's, that's another one that, you know, he's, he's probably in this conversation somewhere. But yeah, I, I think Jermaine, but, you know, th this is one where the addition of the quarterback run is such a, you know, it's been, it's been viewed as such a positive for Ohio State this year that, yeah, your your throwing is probably better if it's Jermaine or maybe Hoying, but you know you're you're probably losing some of that mobility. So, you know that that is an upgrade probably, but not an enormous upgrade. And there's just other spots where you get a bigger upgrade. But you know you want to tell me you want to tell me you've got Andy Katz somewhere on this year's Ohio State team. Yeah, fine, great, that's fine. Two two thumbs up. Do you know Terry Glenn? Sure. You know Joey Galloway, like you said, absolutely. Like I, there's there's plenty of guys, and you know I would put Sean Springs on that list as well. Where y you really would have to have something pretty remarkable to upgrade from the current Ohio State cornerbacks and frankly secondary on the whole this year. Sean Springs was pretty remarkable. He ended up with the number what three pick in the '97 draft, and you know is probably just the best pure cover corner probably that I've seen at Ohio State over the years. Just just a really, really, just a great athlete. 
uh, made some nice plays on special teams as well back when that was a thing you could legally do. So yeah, I think I you know Sean Sean Springs is in my others receiving votes thing here, but that's more of a statement on the 2024 Ohio State secondary than it is on anything else. Yeah, it's crazy when you don't consider Sean Springs, and there's some been some very good safeties, other very good first round corners. We've talked about them over the years as well, but that just goes to show you Denzel Burke, Davis and Igbenosin, Jordan Hancock. I do think Antoine Winfield would be incredible as an Ohio State nickel in Jim Knowles' defense in today's game. Because I do think he could play even at, you know, 5'8", 191 pounds or whatever. You could play him all, all three downs, all four downs, frankly, because he was, as I've said many times, the best tackler I've ever seen at Ohio State. And doesn't matter that he was as small as he was like he, he would he would bring anybody down and he played against some big dudes and he handled them and so I think uh, that's a guy that you could just leave on the field don't have to worry about him he, he'd be locked down and uh, he'd be a knockdown as well so it was a kind of a jerk move by you by not allowing him to be part of this uh, that's uh, apologies to the Winfield family that's on Tom send your notes and letters to him um I think I've mentioned everybody that I had on my list. But yeah, Terry Glenn, I mean, you're looking at a Z receiver. You can do that. Um, I did think of uh, like a Chris Sanders in that same vein where it's like, he's the Devin Smith of this team. You just run deep. You're going to stretch the field. You're going to take some safety with you. And then, uh, you know, everything else happens in front of him. But you do throw deep to him here and there. I think that would be interesting. But um the not going with Sean Springs is to me the I think there are other areas where the gap is larger. And I know Sean Springs, I think we may both agree that he's the best corner at all time of all time at Ohio State. So why would you not have him on this team? It's like, well, because the gap between him and Denzel Burke and Davidson and Igbenosin is maybe not as big or as uh, detrimental as some of the stuff on the offensive line or just the impact that you can have up front for the big daddy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's, that's where I am. And that's kind of where I was, you know, where I was, how I was sort of framing this conversation. Uh, I will also point out that Ohio State had a running back who won the Heisman trophy during the John Cooper era. And we have not said his name either. Again, that, that is uh, much more of a statement on Trevion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins than it is on Eddie George. But you know, again, you you want to th- you want to tell me you're putting Eddie George and Joe Germain and Andy Katzenmoyer on this year's team? I'm saying, yeah, fine. That's that's probably that is probably a material upgrade in all three of those spots. But you know, the the baseline for those positions this year is is pretty pretty solid. So I think that's a that's a tougher spot to to really have a significant upgrade. Hear me out. Um, here's here's a reason why I. Now that you say it, I should have had Eddie George. Eddie George as the H-back type that can play tight end, can play fullback, can play running back. You never know what he's going to be doing with the ball. He can block, allows you to play uh, 21 personnel, two backs, can do so much for you. Oh, yeah, he can carry the ball. Uh, Power guy is is somebody that um, you don't need. But we also talk about, hey, who's going to be that Mitch Rossi type? And when you say Mitch Rossi type, the first name that pops into most people's heads is Eddie George. And I think that's somebody that you could get in there and do some creative things with. Now, that might cost uh, Patrick Gerd some snaps, but I think overall, the addition of somebody like Eddie George to play a uh, multitude of positions. Imagine that, Tom, now with Chip Kelly calling the plays and designing some of this offense. Tell me that this is not a smart decision. Yeah, yeah, believe me. No, no one has said the less good the better more often than I have over the years. But yeah, I do think I do think the possible possibility of a really multiple Eddie George. I mean, I think he only had one touchdown catch in that 1995 season, but it was one where he went like way up, and I think maybe a one-handed catch. I think it was in that Illinois game where he had 314 yards. But you could you know you could get him out as out in space and make, have him make some plays. And you know he was he was a big enough dude. He could be a blocker on the edge. And, oh, yes, uh, also run for 1,927 yards or whatever it was during his uh, Heisman season. Yeah, he's he's another one where, you know, y- you put him in a modern college football offense. He probably, you know, it's pretty hard to win the Heisman as a running back these days. It feels like it's not quite as appreciated a position as it was back then. But, 
he feels like someone who could make a pretty positive mark on uh, the modern college football game as well. 47 catches in 1995 for Eddie George. Wow. Don't tell me he wow. couldn't be involved. Yeah. Not a lot of people remember him. He was a pretty good player. That's all I'm saying. Even though we only we started talking about him uh, you know, 28 minutes into the show. But that will go ahead and do it for us. I um, want to thank you all for tuning in. As always, youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. If you're watching this right now, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. We would appreciate that. Hit the bell to be notified. We are getting ramped up uh, for Big Ten Media Days. And, of course, once Big Ten Media Days hits, then it's like a week later and fall camp is, is starting. Fall camp starts August 1st. We're going to have all kinds of live stuff coming from there as well. So go ahead and hit that bell to be notified when we drop videos, when we go live and do all of those things. And, of course, you can find us at BuckeyeHuddle.com where we talk about all of this constantly. So thank you all for tuning in, and we'll talk to you guys later.